I just got a message um, telling me that uh, recording was in progress, and I think Naomi had put a message in the chat. Um, if anyone does have any objections to be, this event being recorded, um, please let us know. Um, so the purpose of um, today is to launch our vulnerability toolkit. And for those of you who don't know, um, this event is part of a project that uh, Naomi Kreutzfeldt, Marine Cornelis, and Rachel McPherson and myself have been working on uh, over the past four years uh, on access to justice for energy consumers. And we were particularly interested in looking at those who are in vulnerable circumstances and in a condition of energy poverty. And so this event is one of our final events as part of the project. Um, I should mention um, the uh, hashtags. If any of you are on Twitter and social media and you would like to tweet about the event, you can see the hashtags at the bottom of the slide. Uh, hashtag just energy and hashtag access to justice. Uh, another uh, bit of uh, housekeeping before we get started, um, if everyone could have their microphones on mute, uh, that would be appreciated. And you also don't need to have your cameras on just now to preserve uh, bandwidth. So we have a packed agenda uh, for the next hour, which I hope you will find um, stimulating and insightful. And before I hand over to our first speaker, I'll just run through the agenda. So our first speaker is going to be Lindsay Paul. Uh, Lindsay is Director of the Advice Services Alliance here in the UK, and she will open uh, providing a perspective on vulnerability from the advice sector. Uh, next, we will have the project team, uh, specifically Naomi Kreutzfeldt and myself, and we'll provide a brief overview of um, the research project that we've been carrying out, and also just give you a flavor of the main findings that are in the book that we have uh, recently published. I believe it was published uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, and I'm contractually obliged to point out that it is available in all good uh, bookstores and that you are more than welcome uh, if uh, you are interested to go and buy a copy. And uh, finally, we're going to have a panel discussion on the toolkit. So uh, Marine um, is going to give an overview of the toolkit that we have produced. Uh, and then there's going to be a panel discussion with Dr. Elizabeth Blakelock, who's a principal uh, policy officer at Citizens Advice and currently on Scotland GEM, and Marta uh, Garcia Paris, the CEO of EcoService, which is a non profit strategic innovation consultancy uh, specializing in energy and based in Barcelona. So very much looking forward um, to the program that we have here. I hope you'll enjoy it. And without further ado, I will hand over to Lindsay Paul to give her perspective on vulnerability in the advice sector. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. And thank you to you and Naomi for inviting me to, to come today and, and just give some of my perspectives. Um, just briefly to introduce the Advice Services Alliance, we are a cross-sector umbrella group. Um, we represent something in the region of 150 independent advice organisations across England and Wales, um, although the, the, the alliance actually spreads across the whole of the UK, um, all of whom are giving um, free advice to um, on, in areas of social welfare law to people who, if they didn't have access to advice services, would, would otherwise not be getting the advice they need to such solve their problems. And of course, debt problems and energy poverty um, are just one aspect of the things that people come to us with. Um, you may not recognise us, but our members are very familiar and indeed um, been mentioned already today, Citizens Advice, Law Centres Network, Age UK, Shelter are all members of the Advice Services Alliance. Um, what I'm here today to talk to you about is, is some of the kind of lessons that I've personally have learnt, um, really in, in the later stages of my career, I guess, about what vulnerability means and um, how it works in the advice sector in helping people access access justice. So without further ado, my first lesson, lesson number one, if we could have that slide, please. Actually accessing entitlements that people have under the law and then exercising their rights, um, challenging poor decisions is actually a really difficult thing for most people to do. 
Um, I'm involved um, in my area with a, a group of people who are supporting some Syrian refugees. Um, and I was mm. one of my neighbours was absolutely shocked at how difficult it was to apply for universal credit. Um, what the, the stages that you have to go through are actually very, very complicated and difficult. So actually being able to have the ability to do that is, is quite a challenge. And of course, that, that is why the, we then actually need to have allies to help us. If we could move on to the next slide. One of the, um, this is a definition for solving uh, legal problems that I have, um, I've nicked from the public legal education field, which is that there's actually three stages to solving um, a problem. First of all is actually recognizing that you have a problem. Secondly, knowing where to go to get help. And then the last is then being able to act on that. And we do know of clients who find it very difficult to actually realise that the letter that they've got is significant um, or that they're building up debt. Um, and then knowing who it is who's going to be best able to help them. Is it um, one of their friends or somebody that they know who's been through a similar problem or is it going to an advice centre? Is it indeed contacting an energy provider? It's often very difficult for people to know where to go to, um, for help. But this final stage, actually being able to act, is very much based on um, whether or not people feel confident, whether they think that actually being able to um, resolve their problem is, is an outcome for them. And again, that's where the advice sector fits in. So could we flick to the next slide, please? So here's some pictures of um, some members of the advice services over the years. Um, down there in the bottom left hand corner, the colour photograph is Toynbee Hall, um, which is credited as having one of the first free independent advice centres under the poor man's law. Um, as you can see, it's being developed into a much more modern premises now. Um, and then likewise, after the end of the Second World War, um, with helping people to manage the um, welfare state. So over the years, the advice sector has grown as the welfare state has become more uh, complicated and as people need more assistance for um, managing their problems. Can we move on to lesson two, please? The second thing is about what we mean by vulnerability. Uh, it's not a personal characteristic, that's for sure, but we all know it when we, when we see it. Um, on to the next slide, please. So these are some of the circumstances where I've heard the phrase vulnerable people um, used in, in the areas of work that, that I've been involved in recently. Um, and as you can see, it's quite a range of circumstances. It can be people who've got um, disabilities, physical health, poor mental health, but it can also be used for people with low levels of social capital or who are, are fairly uh, socially isolated. Um, it often is used to talk about the experience of people with language and communication problems, or it can be used for sort of general areas, areas of, on, on low incomes. So the, the, you know, the phrase itself is used in lots and lots of different circumstances. Um, and that started me thinking, well, maybe it's actually something that's a bit more situation specific, um, which then led me by a very odd route to think about um, Stott Hall Farm. We could have the next slide, please. So Stott Hall Farm was um, established in um, about 1700, actually. And as you can see, it's uh, um, recognizable as a typical kind of Yorkshire farm um, working in, in the, on the tops of the Pennines, um, you know, sheep, mainly sheep farming. Um, looks like a very kind of a stable and established farm, which it was, and it still is. And if we could come to the next slide, please. Um, but this is where you may recognize it. It's actually the farm that's now in the middle of um, the M62, which goes across the Pennines. Um, it's very well known. People often look out for it. Um, but as you can see, it doesn't look such a wonderful place to be farming now as it, as it was before. 
So there's something here about being vulnerability being situation specific. So if we move on to the last slide, or the last lesson, should I say, um, vulnerability is created by systems that really are not very well designed for the users. Um, and this is one of the biggest frustrations that we have um, in the advice sector, um, that the systems and processes that are meant to be for people to use are often really not designed with, with people at their heart. So if I could move on to the final slide, please. So the difficulty then is about getting help to those with the greatest need. And this is always a challenge. Um, as I've already mentioned, some people don't seek help when they need it. Um, some people come to us when it's very late in, in um, the issue um, and people often are presenting multiple and complex problems. So the challenge then is about working with other people. Um, which is why it's fantastic to hear about the work that's being done with the energy sector. And somebody said to me once that clients aren't necessarily hard to reach, but they're more likely to be difficult to avoid. Um, and I think toolkits such as the one that being discussed today um, is a great help in enabling us to get the help to those with the greatest need. So thank you very much. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing um, the, the rest of the presentations today. Thank you very much uh, for that, Lindsay. That was a really um, great start to the event. If you like that, that last um, issue about difficult to avoid, I think that's quite an interesting different way of, of framing the issues. And hopefully we can come back to some of that in our panel discussion later. Um, so I'm now going to hand over um, to Naomi, who is going to um, introduce um, our ESRC Just Energy project and um, some of the basic themes in our book. Thank you very much. Also, thank you so much to Lindsay, which I, I think um, the point particularly resonated and is very much linked to our research project about the systems that are created, not really with the users in mind. Could I please, after this beautiful slide with our book and the link which I also put in the chat, could I have the next slide, please? Great. So I'll just be talking briefly about our Just Energy project, which evolved, and um, then about our book, which is marking the end of the, the project. Chris and me are generally speaking interested in questions of access to justice, and we've been focusing in, on that um, in our academic research. We've looked at alternative district resolution in general and looked at ombuds in particular for many years. So we came together to do this project um, with the main question in mind about how ordinary people access justice. And pushing that just a little bit further, we're thinking about how marginalized groups and vulnerable people access justice. And at this point, we recruited, as Chris mentioned earlier, two more team members, which was Rachel based in Glasgow and Marine, a true powerhouse and expert in the energy sector. And then we set off to look at the energy sector and focus on it. And why did we choose the energy sector in different European countries? Because it was a really good site in our minds to, in a way, make it manageable, but also to, to look at um, questions of access to justice and ADR and vulnerability. And from a social legal perspective, we had a good angle as there was European legislation that mandated all the member states to have ADR bodies in place for the energy sector and other sectors as well. And so that was a good starting point for our research. And we looked at the UK, France, Catalonia, Italy, and Bulgaria to get a varied and comparative perspective of different legal, geographical, and cultural backgrounds. And really luckily, we managed to do all of our fieldwork before the pandemic hit. So we got some really interesting data. And our book, as we mentioned, not that this is a massive plug for it, is the main academic output of the project. And it's divided into two parts. Part one is where the, co the project team um, co-wrote, and Chris and me will talk a bit about that. And part two was written by country experts for more detail about each country context we looked at, and which can be used as a repository. And I want to say a huge thank you for the authors of part two, some of whom are here today. So thanks to Cosmo Graham, Sarah Sopino and Benedetta Volhaggio, Marine, Anais Vario and Eric 
and with Barlett, Bartlett, sorry, and Theodora Kaneva. So without you, we would have not managed to get so much detail within each country context. Part one, very briefly, we outline the access to justice challenge. The fact that ADR bodies, for example, are supposed to provide access to justice for all. But as Lindsay also mentioned in the, in the beginning, they don't, they're created for a specific type of person. And the great slogan I heard yesterday, thanks to Elizabeth, um, it's for white, wealthy, and healthy individuals. So the justice system, we doubt, is reserved for the few that can, can navigate it with ease, but isn't designed for those who are less able to find routes to accessing justice and services. So there's a definite gap between the ideal theoretical and the, the reality. What we move on to do is to propose a more holistic version of access to justice. So understanding access to justice not only as access to the courts, but to include it to adding the non-legal advice provision, the alternative forms of dispute resolution, internal complaints handling arrangements and firms, for example. Also including, very importantly, a broader range of social and community actors that they recognize is really important in delivering and helping people access justice in, in practice. And our really rich empirical data show clearly that people, especially those who are vulnerable and marginalized, weren't the ones coming to knock on, virtually knock on the door of ADR providers to access justice, but rather we found the amazing activity of local actors in the importance, the role that they played to um, help those who are vulnerable and marginalized to, to find the pathways to actually get help and support in the areas we looked at um, in the energy sector. So this was a very broad whistle stop to a, um, of the main incentives for our project. And Chris will now talk about the, um, a bit of the rest of our findings of, of part one. Thank you. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Naomi, that's great. Um, can I just remind people to maybe just check if all of your microphones are muted? Um, I can hear um, on my end a little bit of feedback, so if, if, any, if everyone could just check and make sure they're on mute, that would be, that would be great. Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll just provide a little bit more detail really on some of these themes that Naomi um, has outlined. Um, the main aim for today is to get to our vulnerability toolkit, but we did want to highlight a few of the main um, findings from the book. So the first um, theme we address is really this need for access to be access to justice to be looked at more holistically. A lot of access to justice literature is still on access to legal aid, access to lawyers, access to courts. And of course, all of that is very important. But as Naomi mentioned, it's not the whole story of access to justice. So the slides that we're showing you here shows some of the ways in which we distinguish our approach to access to justice in the book from more orthodox uh, approaches. And there's a few key shifts that I want to highlight, um, probably about four. Um, the first is a shift from a concern about simply providing people with access to remedial procedures towards a, a concern with actually giving people access to substantive justice. There's been a, an assumption in a lot of policy work and in academic writing um, that access to courts or access simply to a procedure like ADR just ticks the box of access to justice, regardless of the outcome that people actually get, and regardless of whether people's substantive problems end up being resolved. And so we argue that a purely formal conception of access to justice, which is limited to access to procedures, is insufficient. Uh, the second shift that we highlight is from a purely legal conception of justice to one's, to one's, uh, towards one that is more akin to social justice. Um, so we're not neglecting the importance of law, but what we're trying to do here is recognize that people's problems often aren't law shaped and that actually extra legal considerations are often either as important or more important in terms of remedying what we discuss as people's everyday justice problems. Um, tied to that shift from a sort of legal to a sort of broader, more social definition of justice, there's a concomitant need to consider a broader range of access to justice actors, and Naomi had already mentioned this. And what we mean here is not just focusing on lawyers and courts, but looking also at ombuds, ADR, 
providers, regulators, consumer protection bodies, advice sector organizations, uh, such as those which, which Lindsay has mentioned, charities, community groups, and so on. So instead of taking a top-down view, which really sees access to, to courts as a sort of pinnacle, the highest form of protection, we're looking at a much more holistic and bottom-up approach, um, uh, which is really, um, I suppose, uh, recognizing the contribution of people on the ground. And finally, the fourth uh, shift that I wanted to highlight uh, concerns uh, a move from a very individualistic conception of justice to one towards one that prioritizes more systemic concerns. Um, so often there's a focus on redress for the individual, um, and particularly in sort of mass consumer context, that's likely to be quite ineffective and to fail to address the root causes of problems that occur. So a more holistic approach is one that looks at the whole system uh, and considers uh, problems uh, in, in that context rather than seeing them as atomized or individualistic problems. And that requires a shift towards a much more collaborative and cooperative um, system of access to justice. So our approach in the book is to make the theoretical case for this more holistic approach to access to justice, and then to try and show some of the ways in which that holistic view can be realized in the specific context of the European energy sector. If we could move to the next slide, thank you, Nine. So the next main sort of area of, of findings was in relation um, to alternative dispute resolution and to ADR. Now, for those of you who are less familiar um, with um, alternative dispute resolution in the European uh, consumer energy context, um, there's really a vast panoply of different types of consumer ADR mechanisms that operate. You have complaints boards, you have conciliation schemes, adjudication schemes, arbitration schemes. Uh, you have complaint handling that's carried out by regulators, which is quite a common model in energy, and then you have ombudsman. And our first conclusion here, which very much follows, I think, what is a now quite strong consensus amongst other academics uh, writing about consumer ADR, is that the ombudsman model should be preferred over other forms of alternative dispute resolution. And the reasons for this, there are a few of them. Um, the first is that ombudsman position to provide advice and actually help people with inquiries at the kind of front end of their service. So they sort of help people make complaints, but they also signpost people in the right direction. They might also give them some very early advice if it looks like they have a case that um, has no chance of success. So as a result, that's providing some added value functions at the front end. The second um, advantage that ombudsman um, services have is that they're inquisitorial. So rather than simply hearing both sides, like an adjudicator or an arbitrator, the ombudsman has a responsibility for finding facts and applying the relevant law, relevant rules, or the relevant industry practice. Um, I have a comment here that the volume is going up and down. Um, I don't have a microphone listed. So if people could just let me know if that's a problem that persists, I'm just unplugging my laptop in case that helps with the volume issue. Um, it's working if I sat back. Okay, someone's telling me it's better if I sit back. So I'll, I'll try sitting back. Okay. Um, Ombudsman can also uh, operate a number of processes within one scheme so they can do some mediation work but if that doesn't work they can also do some adjudication work and finally um, ombudsmen are able to provide feedback to um, industry and to regulators so it's an added value institution in that sense now there are three broad measures that we think would be um, helpful in terms of improving ADR ombudsman systems and taking them beyond these kind of added value advantages that ombudsman might have uh, and we've sort of defined these as, as issues around sort of supply and demand as a kind of metaphor. Really. Um, in terms of improving the supply of ADR, what we mean here is that if we make ADR processes uh, better able to respond to vulnerability, for example, better to identify people who are in vulnerable circumstances and make processes that are much more appealing to people who might be traditionally excluded from formal institutions of justice, then that should help people to recognize that these are institutions that could help them and therefore um, lead to more people accessing them. 
But that is really recognized not to be a panacea because one of the issues is um, that however good an institution actually is and however good your processes are, a lot of people won't access them because the barriers to accessing justice are much more sort of ingrained and there are very powerful social, cultural and psychological issues that prevent people from raising complaints in the first place, even if you have a very accessible uh, system um, to refer complaints to. So part of the solution here is, is about intermediaries, um, but it's also perhaps about being much more proactive um, in terms of advertising services, in terms of issuing calls for complaints, also going into particular neighbourhoods that are deprived and proactively seeking complaints. So it's a much more proactive and a powerful model that we recommend. And finally, and slightly counterintuitively, um, the last uh, um, recommendation that we have is that we should try and decrease the demand for um, services. Um, so this would involve working collaboratively with syst uh, and systemically with a number of actors, regulators, consumer protection bodies, um, the advice sector, uh, local groups, in order to try and fix problems further down the line. Uh, Naomi also mentioned working with um, firms to improve their internal complaint handling. So anything that could prevent an issue becoming an issue in the first place and then requiring the formal intervention of a third party. So trying to get issues closer to, to the root cause. Okay, I think we're ready for the next slide now, Mahin. Uh, final point we're talking about here is empowering the, the, the local level. Um, so already from what myself said, um, we've clearly identified there's this really big gap between formal institutions on the one hand and the lived experiences of consumers uh, on the other. And local actors, we found in our research, seem to play a really kind of key role. And one of those roles is already quite well established in access to justice literature, um, whereby local actors are seen as intermediaries. So the idea is that you would have groups such as advice bodies that basically are able to reach in to areas that formal institutions um, can't reach um, and then uh, be able to direct issues up towards courts and ombudsmen for example um, and certainly there's there's a key role there but the other role that we looked at in, in our research was that actually they do a lot of direct problem solving um, themselves and that rather than being seen as purely intermediaries to try and get people to move into more formal systems, we should actually recognize that they fulfill the key access to justice function by providing quicker, more rounded, more holistic solutions to the problems that people actually experience. So one of the ways in which we could look at this expanded, more holistic um, system of access to justice is to actually think of these actors not simply as intermediaries or not simply as um, sort of on the edge of access to justice, but seeing them as much more sort of fundamental uh, and as part of a, a more integrated uh, and inclusive system. So just a few uh, insights there. Um, we didn't have time to, to uh, go get to the bottom of, of all of that, but uh, I hope we've given you enough of a flavor of that um, for you to consider buying the book. And we'd be very happy to um, hear uh, from anyone who does read it and would like to give us some feedback. And on that note, I will hand over to uh, Marine. Thank you so much, uh, Chris. Thank you uh, to Naomi and very, uh, very big thanks to you, Lindsay, for this super interesting presentation introduction to our topic. Uh, indeed, our research was uh, very rich. We had the chance to meet a lot of people before uh, the lockdowns, etc. So uh, we, I, I think we, we were quite lucky with the, with the timing. Uh, that said, uh, we uh, noticed uh, during the, uh, the, the, the course of our project that very often um, there was this willingness to look into uh, vulnerability, to, to be here to, to serve uh, the, the, the vulnerable people a little bit more, but sometimes um, the 
people in the field, mostly from ombudsman services or a different kind of ombudsman scheme, were also kind of uh, missing uh, a checklist or a, a toolkit uh, to that they could refer to in order to really become allies uh, and help um, their users to uh, to overcome their vulnerability. So that's why we decided to come up with this very practical uh, toolkit. Uh, it's a very practical outcome of our research. And we also put a lot of emphasis on the uh, design side of, of this toolkit. So we hired a, uh, a graphic designer to, to put our words also in perspective with uh, something um, more visual that could be uh, really used uh, broadly and by a number of people. For the time being, it's only in English. We, are, we would be really thrilled and happy to have it in uh, in, um, in other languages as well. So please just let us know and we will uh, provide you with uh, the copy or directly with the text and uh, if you want to translate it. Very briefly, because it's uh, a, a 10 page document, so this, uh, as you can see, it's very visually appealing and with a lot of colors because we don't think that the situation has to be sad. Uh, it's out of respect for, for the people. We have to be proactive and that's why we chose those, those colors uh, that, are, that, uh, that, that are stimulating rather than, than really um, into, into a complaint or into, uh, into, into misery. Uh, so we, we looked into what is vulnerability, how it can be measured, uh, we, we provided some data as well, just to uh, give some, um, some, some insight, just to set the scene. And then we, uh, we, we provided some tips to recognize uh, the different forms of vulnerability, uh, the different signs of vulnerability as well. Uh, we, um, we, we took some, we extracted some, some quotes from our, the interviews that we, we performed on, on, in the field to, uh, to just check uh, on the situation and really make sure that uh, the people who help are always on top of the game regarding vulnerability. And then uh, we provided a few examples of, also of what, um, where vulnerability can come from. Then on uh, the second uh, part, we had uh, like the response to vulnerability, uh, ways to deal with the expressions of unease, uh, creating a uh, supporting environment, etc., and uh, ways to communicate better and be sensitive to individual needs. This toolkit has absolutely not uh it's here to complement really the tool, uh, the 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 exercise or the uh the, the practice that is already existing on the field. It has absolutely not the vocation to be like the, uh, the alpha and omega of, of addressing vulnerability, but it's really like something that people can use and to, 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 to really make the bet their uh, workplace a better place for vulnerable people. And um, personally, I would still recommend uh, to hire some vulnerability specialists to train the teams as well to, uh, to just uh, go ahead with those kind of, of topics and, and create some, some supportive environment. And then, um, and then the last point was really about uh, setting strategies, uh, learning from the experience of vulnerable individuals, because we 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 think that fairness and energy just and justice in 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 all circumstances has to be a goal. Uh, it has to be really at the root of the of the the, the processes and has to we. At the end of the day, have to serve the people, especially the those who are most in need. So now I would like to give the floor to uh, Marta Garcia, uh, who is the CEO of Eco Service in Barcelona. Uh, Marta has been exceptional during those four years. She has opened her doors, uh, the doors to her office and uh, to uh, to the assessment point in Barcelona uh, to us. And it's been uh, incredible to, to be able to work with you, Marta. So thank you so much for speaking today with us. And um, our other guest is Dr. Elizabeth Blakelock, uh, who is also absolutely fantastic. And um, I hope a hand will show up right now. Uh, <laughs> and um, so Elizabeth is a uh, vulnerability expert. She's now working uh, with Ofgem, but before she was with Citizens Advice. And she 
also has a tremendous experience to share with us about vulnerability. So please, uh, Marta and Elizabeth, the floor is yours. And really, please go ahead and make some comments about this toolkit, please. Thank you, Marine. Thanks for, for inviting us. It's been a pleasure to, to collaborate with you within the project with with Naomi, with Chris, I mean, with all the team, you've made an amazing job. I remember the first meeting in London, March 2019, so two years ago, uh, discussing and starting in this um, field of access um, to justice. Um, as you know, in EcoSurveys, I mean, we, we offer different services to, um, to give advice or to protect and to accompany um, energy consumers in general, and in particular, um, those suffering a situation of vulnerability. And this is why I completely agree with lesson two from Lindsay when she says that um, energy poverty, um, yeah, that, that it's a, it's a, the energy vulnerability um, is not a, a characteristic, but you can uh, recognize it when you see it. And we agree with this. And also, uh, one of the things I want to uh, emphasize today is that the, the importance of the use of the language, so not to talk about um, vulnerable consumers, but maybe about um, people suffering a situation of vulnerability because it's not a condition, but a more a situation of, of vulnerability. During um, our experience uh, tackling with energy poverty and dealing with um, people suffering a situation of vulnerability, um, yeah, we have learned a lot because we were not used to um, to deal with kind, this kind of, of consumers. And this is why we think the toolkit is brilliant because it's a good summary of what we, uh, we, what we um, say a catalog or a catalog, a decalog, a de oh, de ah, decalog of, of measures to when handling or when dealing with navigate, when we navigate through, through this complexity of, of vulnerability. So, um, just to sum up in, in 10 uh, messages and, yeah, and relating it to the toolkit, which I think uh, the toolkit summarizes all 10 messages. But the first one is to be, to be an active listener. If you are a practitioner giving advice to vulnerable, uh, to, to people suffering a situation of vulnerability, you need to hear not only the, the, not only the words, but also the, the, the context. I mean, the message, the, the deep message that uh, people want to, to, to give you. Uh, you need to detect what's under the message. For example, when saying, I can't pay, pay the bill, maybe uh, this is not the only problem. There are more things uh, following this word of, of, I cannot pay the bill this month. Uh, the second would be the empathy. The empathy, and then you also mentioned it in, in the toolkit, I mean, to receive more info, to build trust in order to let the, the, the affected people um, yeah, show what's happening in reality more than in the specific uh, wording that, that they are going to, to express themselves. The third message would be the time. I mean, we are not producing sausages. We are attending people. So please give this time to listen and to learn from, from what people is, is saying um, yeah, with, with their problems and their, their backgrounds and their situations. Never, over uh, never overreact as a fourth message. I mean, you don't have the complete map of the situation when a, when a person explains you what's happening. So don't blame the user because sometimes, yeah, this is the first reaction. I mean, <laughs> and, and you, yeah, just, um, no, don't overreact never, uh, even if it's a bit uh, intense advice. Sometimes it happens that after one hour, you don't reach the problem and, and it's difficult, but yeah, it's, it's important to control ourselves. As a fifth uh, message, um, we need to, I mean, practitioners, not only ombudsman, but all pra or practitioners giving advice on energy, uh, in this case, which is the topic, I mean, accept that we are not superwoman or supermen, we have a limit and we cannot solve all situations. Um, so just do, I mean, what we can at each moment. Uh, for the six, six math message, I would say use simple language, uh, preferably if we use it written and in paper, apart from explaining it verbally, because sometimes the user comes very nervous to you because she, is uh, he, she or his blame, I mean, 
is shy of, of explaining the situation. So sometimes they are not concentrated on what you are saying um, because being there, it's a, it's a big effort. So just uh, try to give simple messages and, and try to complement it with written or, or paper like receipts or something like this. Um, the seventh message I, I wanted to share with you is, um, if possible, try to engage user with a community. I mean, uh, people suffering a situation of energy vulnerability needs, and it would be enriching if he, if he or she joins uh, a community to, re, yeah, to reinforce relations, to still working on the, on the energy aspects more than only the, the energy bill or the specific um, advice in the case. Um, try to empower the user better than only help him or her solving the situation. It's better if, if it's possible to empower um, because it's going to happen again and again. So it's better if, if the user and the people affected uh, for an energy vulnerability situation can, if, if he or she can manage the situation by himself. Um, and yeah, normally people suffering a situation of energy vulnerability don't have the resources or the tools to complain or to access to justice. So try to accompany in this case more deeper because if not, it's going to, to be lost. <laughs> and last but not, not least, uh, people um, that we attend, that we give advice are more expert than us on vulnerability. So we need to be modest in this case and learn from them. And, and I think this is a continuous work. I mean, it's day by day and we are continuously learning from, from people that we, that we are giving advice to. So thank you for your toolkit. And I think that we are going to use it a lot. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. It's, uh, it's, it's really, really good to, to hear that from you. Um, Elizabeth, your turn. Thank you. So just the three things from me. What a brilliant turn, though. Thank you for those. Um, first, though, I, I just wanted to say I'm not sure if there's a more timely moment to have such a practical toolkit for supporting consumers in vulnerable circumstances. I mean, many of us have had a significant impact on our health and finances in the last year, well, nearly two years now. And this, in turn, impacts the way we need to interact uh, with firms and organisations of all kind. So with the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, reaching every corner of the globe, it was no surprise to me to read that three in four European citizens are consumers in vulnerable circumstances, that their circumstances or the market systems are posing a risk to their well-being. So for those of us with a concern about citizens being able to exercise their rights, this toolkit has important implications for the ways that they raise their concerns about essential service providers, particularly those who have been most significantly impacted by COVID-19. Now, in the data from charities I read in the UK, these are people who are lone parents, have long-term health conditions, and are, have, and are in ethnic minority groups. Here in the UK, charities highlight the risk that the energy system only benefits people who are white, wealthy, and healthy. And those of us who want to stand as allies to consumers in vulnerable circumstances need to ensure that we deliver systems which include those we might have once called hard to reach, or as I've heard more recently, easy to ignore. So we can add that to the list of alternatives <laughs> to hard to reach. I like easy to ignore because it really, I think, captures the structural impact of inequality and its long reach through history. And therefore the stronger call for action from all of us who are in this space. So what three things have I been thinking about doing differently having read the toolkit? Well, there are three core areas. Firstly, I was reminded of the richness of complaints data. I love data. So data you can use to improve your services. Data you can use as insight to build piece by piece the processes, the customer journeys, which will meet, reach more and more of those people who need them the most. Now, the way to respond to this insight once you have it is to get as close as possible to understanding the experiences of your clients and customers. And this includes an explicit focus on empathy at every level. Inclusive design principles can support you in how to directly engage with consumers if you're a firm 
It might be a focus group, it might be a citizen jury from the public sector. And these groups can play a really important role in decision making. But while you think about those larger pieces, perhaps while you negotiate for the budget, I would really recommend getting close to your frontline staff. They speak to your customers and clients every day. And understanding what they see and hear can be a really important first step in closing the gap between decision making and lived experience. Finally, and most core for me, is reflecting on the importance of lived experience for all customers and clients. It's more, so much more straightforward when the people who make up your team are diverse, whether that's at the front line or at any decision making level. If the people in your team reflect the citizens you serve, then you can close that gap so much more straightforwardly and you will have the skills in house to engage with those experiences, to improve them in, in, a, in a respectful and empathetic way. Now, of course, we should come to that with humility and listen carefully, but diversity of your teams is a fantastic shortcut to accessing the, the experiences that you need to be embedded in every process. I'm really looking forward to hearing about how people put this toolkit into place whether they're in the call today or listening to it back. So I hope you'll share them with us as we go forward. And thank you to the authors of this toolkit. Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth. It's, it's really uh, going back to what Marta said about the importance of building teams and, and listening to the people's experience because at the end of the day, an organization is only the sum of the people who make it. So, um, so um, having diversity, having different lived experience within the company really uh, should truly help to build um, a more empathetic environment and a place where um, this kind of toolkit will no longer be necessary because everybody understands and make use and really embrace uh, the kind of, of suggestions or recommendation that we pulled in this toolkit. I would like to invite back uh, Chris and Naomi to show their beautiful faces again, and maybe even Lindsay, if you're still around. Okay, um, yes. Um, so um, I'm, I'm I don't have any questions here in the in the in the chat, so please go ahead. Uh, we have about uh, forty people here, so uh, make your make your point, ask your question. It's it's really the time. We have only ten minutes left before the the official end of our project. That's truly sad, uh, but uh, but yeah, long live this uh, this toolkit because I think there are so many interesting things, uh, so many interesting elements that I, I wish I had seen somewhere before. And you know, uh, as they say, if you don't find the product you are looking for, then create it. And that's exactly what we did this, with this toolkit. Um, so I, I hope that it will be used uh, by uh, many different organizations and that it will serve a lot of people. Can I respond to, to Neil's point in the um, in the chat there, Neil Sinkoff, around yes, um, the role of collective action, activism, and struggle? Um, I heard a really compelling analogy um, recently of you can only spend so many time pulling people out the river before you look upstream to see who's pushing them in. And I think as we continue this work, it's very natural that you respond to the client that's in front of you. But it is so important to recognize that there are structural issues which are impacting us all across the piece, not just in energy, and an acknowledgement of how those are impacting people on an everyday level is incredibly important if we want to do anything impactful in their lives to support them. Um, and that means also keeping in touch with each other and being able to use the evidence that we individually see um, in terms of people's lived experience to articulate that as a really powerful reason and powerful evidence base for change. Thank you, Elizabeth. May I just quickly come in and then I'll give others the space. What I find really interesting is that we managed to create this toolkit, not you know, for a UK context specific, for example, but we managed to provide something that's applicable to most situations, which means moving beyond what I mentioned earlier, the laws and regulations that we started the project off on. There seems to be a universal, dare I say that, language that we can apply and tools that we can suggest to a wide, wide context that even moves beyond this, this energy context that we're looking at in this project which to me is a very encouraging thing because we're here from different 
different countries and different sectors, but yet we all have the same affinity to understanding what this toolkit is supposed to do and aimed at. So I think that's something very encouraging. It is indeed very encouraging, but as William Baker said, it's indeed there is indeed a problem of funding of advice, uh, which doesn't encourage empathy, time, or required to deal with problems or make sure cross referral processes are in place. Indeed, uh, uh, it's like empathy is on the back of every everybody's mind, but it's never implemented because you need productivity instead. But as Martha said. Um, we, we need really to, to, to serve the people. Um, you need to, to listen to them and somehow, maybe if you design better the process because you take into account their complaints, as Elizabeth said, it's a cheap, really cheap way to, to understand what people have in mind. Uh, you, at the end of the day, keep on keeping their, their, their issues and their, 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 their problems, the structural problems really on the top of the of the game so um it's it's really important to to see that it might not be a question only of money but also maybe of willingness and of uh being open to uh to this kind of um maybe negative feedback or uh not ideal uh experience that that some people may have Anna uh, Stoilovska also made an excellent uh, point. Uh, she wanted to hear about the formal institutions not being equipped to help vulnerable consumers. It's re-educating formal institutions, the logical approach to closing the, dap, the gap, or what else can be done? Um, and yeah, I would like to give the floor to Chris about this because it's really about part two of our book, I think. Sorry, my sound wasn't very good there. Um, Marine, was this uh, the point about the formal institutions? Yes, exactly. Is uh, yeah, do we need to re-educate formal institutions, or what else can be done? Personally, yeah. I would go in different directions, not only one. Yeah, well, exactly. I think so. So I think that's what we that's what we're recommending. So I think part of what we're saying is that existing formal institutions can do a lot more. And I think we've already had suggestions from Marta and from Elizabeth, things around making sure that you have diverse workforce and so on that can be really, really helpful. Um, I think a lot of organizations are still not particularly good at identifying vulnerability. Um, a lot of them are at fairly early stages in terms of even just defining the concept, let alone actually finding ways in which it can be sort of operationalized. Um, so I think there are, there are various ways in which that could be improved, but I think absolutely that's, that's, that's really in a way quite a small part of the current problem, um, particularly looking at it from the, the context of ADR. Um, there needs to be a lot more in terms of bringing the individuals who are most in need um, to access sources of help. And I think there needs to be an element of prioritization which I'm not sure is foremost in the minds of many, certainly justice uh, policy actors. Um, I'm not sure about other contexts. Um, and I think the, the, the points that we were trying to make around um, reducing demand for these services, you know, obviously that's a hugely challenging agenda. And I think Neil's right to raise the point that that's not necessarily going to solve anything without the, the broader structural change. But I think it's probably a starting point. Um, and I think, you know, if we're thinking about how we can, working with existing institutions and existing structures, try and make things better for now, then I think that's probably where I would put most of my efforts. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers the question. But, uh... I think that does answer their question. And Lindsay, I would be really curious to hear what you have to say about this. And it was the first time you saw the toolkit. So what do you think about it? No, oh, I have to say it looks uh, fantastically useful. And um, yeah, I mean, I mean, my brain is just going into overdrive thinking <laughs> about it, really, because there's so many, so many different ways that I think that we can we can use, uh, first of all, the, you know, the findings from the report, but also in disseminating, um, you know, across the advice sector. Um, a, a couple of things that I think are reflections really. One is um, the, about the issues about campaigning and looking at the kind of more structural issues that are there. 
Um, and it's always struck me that rights are very hard fought for and, and very easily lost. And, you know, it's we, we do have to be so careful, really, that um, we make sure that we hang on to those those rights that we have and that people are able to exercise them there because they they, they can be fragile. Um, in terms of the kind of funding issues, um, there just seems to be so many processes at the moment that are designed to um, you know, make it more difficult somehow for um, either for for um, to get access to funding or to um, you know it just it, it often feels that the, the the computer is set on no you know so. Um, and, you know, particularly issues around competitive tendering we have found have been um, very difficult in, in terms of actually ensuring that, um, that people get the, the, the help that they need right across the board. Um, and I've been very inspired by other places where they've started to think about, um, for example, in the NHS, where they're starting to think more about procuring on a place-based basis. So there are, there are some interesting um, kind of initiatives in, in other, other areas, I guess, that we can, we, we can call on to, to look at this. Um, but yes, my brain's working in, in overdrive at the moment and <laughs> thinking about all the different ways that we can we can distribute this among our networks. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. It's it's really good to have the support, uh, your support and the support of somehow your organization. And we, we really hope that it will help ma make a difference somewhere. Uh, there are some uh, very good, interesting questions. Can, like, can this toolkit be used across different contexts? Of course it can. And uh, this, this is like the idea of this toolkit, having something not too prescribing because it's here just to, to help you think about what would work best for you and your, your company, your organization or whatever. And, uh, we never aim to be like the experts on this field because we think that like Marta, uh, that uh, people who are experiencing vulnerability are more experts than we are. But uh, this is a way to, to start a conversation. And if you can really use this toolkit um, with your colleagues just to start your conversation, at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the day, there will be more uh, engagement as well. And as, as Elizabeth sa said, um, it's, it's important to have a, diverse, a diversity directly within your employees, with the people who work for you and with you. So um, it also includes their vulnerability or maybe their mental health or some problems that might be totally uh, hidden uh, that you are not aware of, but that you can maybe discover uh, through a uh, training or through an informal discussion. And then later it can it can go up, um, and it's uh, it's it's really uh, something you can customize and make uh, um, custom uh, context specific. So um, now, me, Chris, is there anything you would like to add? Because we have only two minutes left. Left. Thank you very much, Marvin. Yeah, maybe just to to wrap it up. And I love these very short and intense meetings and it would have of course been lovely to see all of you in person but this way we can have our lunch in parallel do this and move on with our day i think i just want to say a big thank you to all of you who've come today and who've spoken and who've been part of our project to those who've authored chapters of our book in part two it's it's been an honor and a pleasure to work with you it was both chris and me came into this as i mentioned in the beginning from the academic perspective, looking at access to justice and other areas, and have really started to engage with the whole space of vulnerability characteristics and thinking about vulnerability more broadly, which has definitely enriched my thinking and my research outlook for the future. So it was a wonderful project, and it's also so nice to have produced something in collaboration that is practical for those who work with the people and don't just write about them theoretically. So this is one of the hopefully impactful, usable things. Obviously, we'd love for you to buy our book as well. But this seems to be something that we can we can put out there for you to, to use and develop and build upon. So a massive thank you from all of us as project team. And we hope to, to see you again soon. Absolutely. 
there's only one thing that I wanted to mention before we leave is that we also have developed this access to energy justice platform where we want to share the story of uh, people and organization facing uh, systemic issues uh, regarding uh, energy justice. So please contribute, have a look, uh, access to energy justice uh, website. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye.